Hey, thanks for joining us, everyone. Uh, this is our second uh, Matcha Matcha um, Meta Research seminar. Um, this week, we're hearing from Gavin Stewart. Uh, Gavin is based at, at uh, Newcastle University in the um, Modeling Evidence and Policy Research Group. Uh, he heads up the evidence synthesis side of things there. Uh, Gav's got a long history of um, uh, dealing with a lot of meta-analysis across lots of different disciplines, medicine, um, education, conservation, um, and he has a, a passion for, for flowers, and particularly rhododendrons. Uh, but he's going to tell us today about the need for evidence-based decision-making and scientific reform. So thanks, Gav. Take it away. Thanks very much, Matt and Charles, and thanks for inviting me. And because uh, Matt's based in Norway, I've tried to put some kind of Norwegian stuff about thanks for listening and things on there. And this first slide is trying to uh, represent these three kind of disciplines that we need this evidence based decision making across. So we kind of got ecology, conservation, environmental decision making. We've got medicine. And then for the kind of social sciences, I've got I've got a kind of stupid behaviour because social scientists like to study behaviours, particularly stupid ones. Um, <laughs> and really, the focus of this talk is on is on the need for evidence based decision making and, and science reform. Specifically in ecology, but it's often the case. The generalities apply well beyond uh, ecology. So this is this is just a slide saying why do we need evidence synthesis and really the the point is that if if we're doing applied science in any arena then we're going to need our evidence synthesis. You know, so traditionally ecologists are sitting in these boxes, you know, life on land, life below water, or maybe climate change boxes. Um, but increasingly we're looking at these interdisciplinary applications. Um, but, the, but, but the point is, we need evidence to inform our decision making, um, pretty much irrespective of the domain that we're working in. And pretty much the whole point of this talk is to say, if you want to do that well and accurately, you shouldn't be relying on single studies. Because for a variety of reasons, single studies are problematic. Next slide, Matt. So we want evidence based decision making. Um, um, to inform to inform our decisions, but when we get into this problem of what is evidence, okay, um, is expert judgment evidence? You can start asking those, then the questions about how often do people make the right predictions, but you can equally say how often do scientific studies make the right predictions? And there's this great paper by John about why most published research findings are false. Um, I'm less keen on his current output regarding COVID, but that's a bit of an aside. So just because we've got something in the paper and it's been through peer review and it's published somewhere high impact doesn't mean that it's reliable, doesn't mean it's presenting robust evidence. Um, if you get a gang of experts together, like a SAGE committee to advise the government on COVID response, again, you've just got a committee of the great and the good. Do they make the right predictions? But all evidence needs value judgments to assess its strength. So you need people in whatever kind of decision making system you do develop. So it's difficult. And really, maybe rather than saying, what is evidence? What we're really interested in is never mind what evidence is, how reliable is our evidence? How sure are we that we're right? And that's the really important thing. Um, next slide, Matt. Cheers, mate. So, and the answer to that is we're not sure at all. Um, and you know, this idea of a replication crisis has been has been coming in, and you know, in, in many ways, it's been around for ages because people have been meta-analyzing studies and looking at between study variation for an awful long time. Um, but more recently, psychologists in particular noticed that an awful lot of their classic uh, assumptions and the kind of you know papers with thousands of citations. If they were, if they did a try, a direct replication, an exact replication of the study, 
that they weren't replicating. And and this has kind of cascaded and, and, and developed into this open science movement, which is really welcome. Um, but sometimes the links between open science and meta-analysis and evidence synthesis aren't always as apparent as perhaps they should be. Next slide. Uh, this is just some of the kind of empirical evidence about this about this problem of uh, replication. And I've got a med medical example, uh, preclinical studies, so that might be relevant to you, Matt, um, with your animal work, psychology. Um, a lot of the time, it's quite difficult to do meta epidemiology in these areas. So an awful lot of this stuff is kind of done by sending scientists questionnaires saying, how often do you do this and how often do you do that? Um, and that's that's a kind of methodological growth industry at the moment. And, and papers like that are, are coming out in different domains all over the place. Next slide. So we've got this problem. And why have we got this problem? And the, and the first thing is the fact that although we all do all these diverse studies for diverse reasons, and we don't want anybody to tell us what we should measure or how we should measure it, as soon as we come to analyze it, we all do the same thing and it's a stupid thing to do. Um, and the next is the link at the bottom of this. Um, of this slide, which is where the next few slides come from, and it's it's this dance of the p-values um, idea. But I find this is really interesting and fabulous, and this is a lovely little way of of explaining the problem with p-values. Uh, and really, it's another. Actually, this is a social science issue, okay? Because we had Fisher and Gossett back in the day figuring this out, and Gossett got it right, but he was just. Uh, an applied statistician working for Guinness and Fisher got it wrong, but he was the big heavyweight with all the citations. And uh, so we did what Fisher said instead of what Gossett said, which was a bit stupid. Um, so we think of we think of P as strength of evidence. Next slide, Matt. And we use the significance language to describe uh, to describe that. Uh, next slide. And that suggests a truth about an effect. And, you know, any statistician will tell you this is wrong, but this is how it works with applied scientists. Um, next slide. And this evokes an emotion uh, because this stuff matters. Um, and next slide, Matt. And it matters because it has implications. OK, so you get your significant results and, and you do. You do get the, the academic rewards and that leads to your career. And if you don't get the right results, then, you know, it's much harder to get things published because of publication bias, which we'll talk about in a moment. And life gets very hard. So we're using these p-values to kind of determine strength of evidence. And that is... That's mainstream. That's it's, it's all very well saying that isn't how it should be done, but that is how it's done. Um, and if we're going to do that, these things should should have evidential value, okay? Um, and they don't, and that's the problem. So next slide, Matt. Um, if you click on this YouTube link at the bottom there, then you'll see you'll see the simulation being run to um to look at this and effectively what you're doing is you're setting up two normal distributions with a standardized mean difference of 0.5 between them and then what you're doing is you're going to take a sample from each distribution and you're going to say what's the p-value and what happens if you do that depends on the power but next slide matt but the point is that you get a range of p-values Okay, and sometimes they're significant and sometimes they're not significant. Um, and because we're using p-values to determine which results are important and which ones aren't, we're hacking and harking and we're doing all of these things, which I'll talk about more later. This has got really serious consequences for the rigor of our science. Um, and it's this kind of interaction between 
hacking, harking and publication bias. That's coupled with selective reporting that just means that, you know, an awful lot of what we publish is just not worth anything. And it's a real shame because because that is hard, hard collected data in it and it should be worth a lot. Next slide. Uh, so this is work that Matt Granger did. He kind of came across a paper and uh, he was quite incensed by what this paper was saying. And he said, Gav, could you have a look at this? And I had a look at it and said, yep, the technical word you're looking for is bollocks. <laughs> um, and Matt, Matt went and the, the second graph here is showing the distribution of p-values if you run the simulation for the size of effects and its precision and the power that, that this study had. Simply on the basis of having a p-value, they were saying that there were differences when clearly there were no differences and they just had a significant p-value by chance. It's pretty much a 50-50 chance whether or not you're going to get a significant p-value in this particular example. So rather than a simulation, this is showing a real example where p-values are misleading. Then this is rife. This is my point. It's not like an isolated case. It's really easy when people are kind of critiquing science to think, yeah, maybe there's a bit of a problem sometimes, but there isn't a bit of a problem sometimes. This is all over everything, everywhere, in nearly all disciplines. It's a real problem. Okay, next slide. Um, um, a big part of the reason why it's a problem is the publication bias. Okay, so there are all sorts of publication biases. There are all sorts of reasons why you get systematically unrepresentative results. Okay, and some of this is about the way that evidence accumulates over time. Um, and you know, there's a, quite a lot of evidence, particularly from medicine, that generally what happens is you get a small study with a large effect initially and then you know if you do your cumulative meta-analysis you find out well maybe there is an effect but it's much smaller than we first thought it was that's a kind of fairly typical pattern um, or maybe it isn't there at all so there's often bias in the size of an effect uh, particularly when you're looking at effectiveness reviews um, but we also have this problem that we simply publish the things that are statistically significant Next slide. And this is a this is a funnel plot for anyone who isn't familiar with them. Um, next slide, Matt. There's a, a study, an individual study is represented on this plot. Next one. This is an overall effect or a true effect. You can think of it in either way from a meta-analysis in the middle there. Next, Matt. And you get the large studies are at the top of this graph with small standard errors. Next. And the small studies that are more variable are at the bottom of a graph. And because they're more variable, they're more spread out in terms of what their effect estimate is on the x-axis. Next graph. Next. And in these analyses of funnel plots, 95% of the studies should be in the funnel. You can do all sorts of fun things contour enhancing them and all sorts, but don't worry about that, it's the basic idea. Next slide, Matt. Thanks a lot. And what happens when you get publication bias is you get this asymmetry. You get a hole in this side. Uh, it's important to say that just because you've got funnel plot asymmetry doesn't necessarily, it doesn't mean that you have got publication bias. It's a pattern that's consistent with publication bias. Now, what it's really saying is there's a difference between large and small studies. And you've then got to say, well, why is there a difference between large and small studies? But a very plausible explanation for that is that things with small effects or that aren't statistically significant aren't being published, depending on the direction of the effect. Um, next slide, Matt. Yeah, OK. And again. Okay, so we've got we've got we've got this problem, and then we've got which is we, when we've got the problems of of hacking and harking. Okay, 
So once you think about how you go about analysing data or doing a study, you tend to do lots of things in different ways. And then we consciously or unconsciously introduce bias with selective reporting. So the example I've got here is that you might develop a structural equation model with two different structures because you're not quite sure how the world works. So you've been really good. And instead of just taking your favorite theory and saying this is the structure, you've said, I don't know, I'll do two structures. Then you split the data into male and female, and then you analyze the complete cases and the imputed data. Um, unfortunately, you don't get any statistically significant results when you do that. Um, and so you go away and you look at left-handed men wearing green socks and you find there's a very interesting subgroup there and you've got a significant result. Okay. So if you're doing that kind of um, analysis again and again and again, then no amount of Bonferroni correction or anything else is going to save you from the problem that you're p-hacking. And the other thing that's very common is that you, even if you're trying to be good, you have all of that and you have it laid out like in this little flow diagram here. Um, but then you tell the story. You go back and you tell the interesting story. And I don't know how often PhD students at all look for the interesting story. I'm not interested in all of these irrelevant bits of results here and there and everywhere. I'm interested in the story. And that's harking. That's where we go back from this significant result that we've got and we construct a story that's partial because the real evidence is saying, well, actually, it's only by doing this set of things that this happens. Um, and this, this, again, is a huge problem um, where, where we're studying complex systems that can be measured in lots of lots of different things can be measured in lots of different ways in lots of different contexts you know and uh, if we look at any of these big global problems that we're looking at that are interdisciplinary it's like that if you look at most ecology it's like that if you look at an awful lot of social science it's like that you know i've been involved in some horrendous projects where people kind of go off and ask 2,000 people, 190 different questions. And, you know, you get this beautiful, perfect data set of all of these responses. And then, then you just go into it. And sometimes st statistical analysis is almost designed to, to p-hack. And then you get an interpretation of harking and you publish it. And there are entire fields that, that that's normal. That's what you do. That is analysis. That is science. And if you look at the output of that, it's so misleading. No, it's it's a horrendous problem. Okay, next slide. Um, yeah, the other kind of problem that we can have with this as well um, is that you don't know what's gone on here. In order to know that someone had hacked or harked, you, you, they have to tell you that they've developed that SEM with two structures and split the data into male and female. And if you're going to use it in evidence synthesis, then of course they have to re report it the bits and pieces that you need to derive the effect sizes. Um, and neither, uh, uh, very often, neither of those things will you know. So you might not be able to use it even if you know what they've done, but probably you don't even know what they've done as well. Next slide. Um, Again, just to kind of show that this isn't just me ranting about how terrible it all is, is this is a, you know, apologies to the authors for picking on them, but this is a real example of problems with researcher degrees of freedom that's kept, that I've come across in a, in a review that I was involved with. You know, and the authors in this study measure loads and loads of different things in loads of different ways, and but then report things that are clearly, they report the one or two things that they find that are statistically significant uh, as if they were the important things. And it's very clear if you if you kind of read the paper in depth and look at what they did and why they did it and how they did it. But it's very much um, um, storytelling that they're harking um, and of also p-hacking because they're talking about the statistically significant results. Next slide. 
so we we've got this problem with with primary research doing all of these things and we've also got problems with what we think about as good research because good research has got to be novel often with sound theoretical underpinnings uh but this is tricky because um you, certainly on the on the theoretical side of things you 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 might very well your view of a world might very well be based on theory um and it might help you kind of define the plausible kind of the plausible ways that you're going to think about the world from a multiverse um so i'm not saying that theory doesn't have any role and of course it has a role in looking at interpreting evidence afterwards whether or not your results are consistent with theory the problem here is that one person's sound theoretical underpinnings or another person's complete and not a rubbish and the problem with novel well there are a couple of problems with novelty but um this this idea that things have to be new to be um to be valuable is you know in the context of saying most of what we're publishing is wrong then that's clearly not very philosophically tractable we'll talk more about the other problems later so uh, i've got a kind of picture of a grouse on a, on a wall here to say that really what we should be interesting in is is building a structure building a wall with our studies um so that we really know what's going on and uh, often what we're really interested in is causation so you know if you're going to say does a cup of tea make somebody feel better then you know you might be interested in the fear the theory and you might be interested in the molecules and chemicals that are in the tea and whether or not there's some kind of a pathway by which they impact with people's neurons or you might be much more worried about how how am i sure that it was the tea that made you feel better and so you might be much more concerned about your experimental design and wanting to say can i is this a context in which i can use a randomized control trial and if it isn't how am i going to figure out my my dag so that i can think about the confounders and the collider bias and make sure that i'm getting a causal relationship and that that might be an awful lot more important than whether or not the research is novel with sound theoretical underpinnings. Yet the emphasis, particularly when we're looking at grant applications, is very often on the novelty and, and the theoretical underpinnings. Next slide. So rather than rather than looking at that, I think we need much more to think about how research updates our beliefs about evidence and we need to think about uh, strength of evidence and there's all sorts of different frameworks for doing this but, but this one this grade framework that's used widely in medicine is fantastic in many ways now it's not good in terms of saying there's a lot of uncertainty surrounding what the best thing to do is and here's a nice probability distribution of it so a lot of modelers don't like this framework because of that but it's fantastic for thinking about do i need a new study and why do i need a new study and is my new study going to make any difference so if you're thinking about research waste this is a really important framework uh, so the first thing that you're going to think about is you know i've got some uncertainty in my evidence base i'm planning a new study is it going to be any good is it going to help improve strength of evidence and you've got this risk of bias prop which is effectively the causation so have i got a new experimental design am i looking at this study in a way that means that i'm going to reduce an uncertainty if if it was a direct replication so zero novelty absolutely no novelty whatsoever but it increased precision and that was the problem with the evidence base you know what the effect is, but you don't know the effect precisely enough to be for it to be policy relevant. Just an increase in precision can be what is needed for strength of evidence. More usually, you're interested in understanding variability. Yeah, so especially in these disciplines like ecology and social science, we have incredibly high heterogeneity by medical standards. Um, the point of meta-analysis often isn't just to get this kind of one pooled effect it's to explore this variation 
Um, and so if you're doing a new study um, that tells us why about context, why do studies vary, then that's really, really important. Um, but if you're doing a study to explore inconsistency rather than to develop an overall effect, then it might have a very different design to a study that was focusing on understanding risk of bias. Um, is the problem publication bias? In which case, how are you going to address publication bias in your study? Um, and then the last one is, is directness, which is about, is this study relevant to your decision context? Because you could have two studies that are kind of equally good, as it were, equally robust and reliable, but one of them is in the right decision context and one of them isn't. Um, so you've got to think about, have I got the right decision context? Uh, there's loads and loads of papers about this framework in medicine. Okay, next slide. So summary to date, okay, is this isn't good news, we're bad. We've got this over-reliance on p-values. We've got publication bias. We've got selective reporting and storytelling. We've got inappropriate emphasis on novelty and failure to standardize measures. We're not considering cumulative evidence appropriately. And then, you know, I briefly mentioned poor reporting on top of it. So all of that together means, A, doing a good evidence synthesis is hard. And B, if you go and take a single study and plonk it in front of a decision maker and say, make your decision on the basis of this, in all probability, you're making, it's an it's a, you're going to make an erroneous decision. Um, no, and I think that this is the bit that scientists really struggle with because they go to so much time, effort, writing these papers, getting them through peer review, getting them published. And the idea to, to someone who's unfamiliar with evidence synthesis that that is deeply flawed and unreliable is, is very unpalatable, um, but it's true. So rather than just ranting about it, what are the things that we could actually do about this if we wanted to, if we, wanted to sort, if we, if we agreed that this was actually a problem, what are the things we could do? Next slide. And again, Matt. Okay, and again. And again. Thanks. Right. So the first thing we can do is report and interpret effect sizes and confidence levels. Okay, because they convey much more information than p values. And we've got a little kind of a little plot here where you know you can see that the p value of these three effects, A, B, and C, is exactly the same. But the policy implications, you know, depending on what a minimally important effect is and all the rest of it would be very different. You know, so if you've got study C, then you're probably not going to use this treatment because it's got a tiny effect if it has an effect at all. Study B um, might have a quite a substantive effect or might have no effect at all. That might be the one where you're kind of saying, let's do some more research. Study A, it's a bit of a punt if you look at the kind of lower confidence interval, but probably, you know, all other things being equal, you might go for it as a decision maker. It's a completely different policy implications for policy and practice, but exactly the same p-value. Um, and then we need to establish the reporting guidelines to enforce this. You know, it's the, the fact that in this day and age, you pick up a paper and you can't even work out what the sample size is. I mean, power can be very complicated if you've got, you know, some big complicated linear model or some kind of in individual patient data meta-analysis or whatever you can, you know, big complicated analyses, it's very hard to work out what the degrees of freedom are. That's, that's an issue. Um, the transparency but more often it's just a problem that people just don't think it's important and they've got a table somewhere with a p-value in it and that'll do and you know that, that's terrible um, and it's worth saying that there's some advocacy for banning p-values altogether um, and I, I would be quite happily you know hold my hand up to belonging in that group that thinks they cause more more harm than good, and we probably should get rid of them altogether. But that's strong medicine for most scientists. Okay, next slide. Publication bias. Okay, 
we need to we really need to take this open science stuff on the chin and just get on and do it and yes it's a bit of a pain and yes it's another thing to do but the benefits of doing it are absolutely massive so if we pre-register studies then that gets rid of all of these pro problems of uh, of the harking and the storytelling and if we have the open data and open methods then you can see what's gone on and what happens and why if you just think about what's going on with covid at the moment you know it is a paper retracted from new england journal of medicine big problems um if, if we'd if that had all been done using open science principles there would just have been no no problem at all and again it's kind of it's a bit mental that our primary dissemination mechanism you know was invented for a victorian gentleman's club and it was fine for a victorian gentleman's club but we're still using that as our primary means of disseminating information today and you know I'm sorry, but I'm not in the Victorian Gentlemen's Club, even if the rest of the world is. Um, yeah, we need to move on. So open science is the way forward. Next slide. Selective and poor reporting. Well, if we have less reliance on p-values, that, that helps. If we have adherence to reporting guidelines, that helps. But again, it's the pre-registration, open data, open methods. And we'll really know exactly what you've done and everything is there and clear. Okay, so we need much more emphasis on this. Brilliant, next slide. Um, and we need to consider the cumulative evidence in, in a really meaningful way, not just kind of saying, oh, we'll do a review and having some poor person having a kind of scramble together some dodgy review in, in two months. Proper meta-analysis, systematic review, decent high quality decision models. Okay, if we, if we do a lot more evidence synthesis, one thing is that we'll be able to inform policy without the hype. Yeah, but, but it also means that scientists will get exposure to deficiencies in the current evidence. There's nothing like doing a meta-analysis and extracting effect sizes to make you realize how real and how widespread these problems of poor reporting are and the hacking and the harking and the fact that people aren't reporting what they should report. You first read the paper and you think that's fantastic, that's fine, I'd let that through peer review, no problem at all, it's great. And then you try and get an effect size out of it and it's just like, my God, what a nightmare, what a mess. So, you know, everybody should be doing meta-analyses, even if it's just as part of a training as a scientist to kind of understand what, what the issues are. And we need to get this, this focus on strength of evidence rather than novelty. Um, so this is kind of a slide that's a, really about the way that we think about funding. You know, that if we're going to have a call for new studies, then that needs to be informed by evidence synthesis. And then it needs to be capable of, inform, of updating those evidence syntheses. You know, and if we did that, then we'd kind of tie up things like that we would get, we would be thinking much more about common outcomes rather than novelty. You know, another thing that I get quite cross about is, you know, you come across a study and if only they'd measured things the, the way that they were measured in the previous study, you'd be able to combine them and you can't. So you can't combine them. And it's, you've got to say, why have you done it in a different way? And, and often, there isn't actually a rational reason. One tiny little caveat, this is another paper from John here. There's a, there is a big problem with lots and lots of crap meta-analysis. Um, you know, well, there's a, there's, we've got a, a bigger problem, I'd argue, with lots and lots of crap research. But I agree the solution um, here is, is robust evidence synthesis. There isn't any value in doing lots and lots of crap. Um, meta-analysis all that you'll do there is exacerbate the problem of crap evidence floating around next slide more meta science okay so this this talk is largely is experience based and you know i can say these things and other, i can you know I can stick loads of references on and i can other people have said these things in this discipline and that discipline but 
there isn't very much meta science on this. We can't say what's a large effect or how large is the effect in the first study compared to the last study, you know, like I was talking about with the cumulative meta analysis. How many studies are wrong because of hacking or harking? No, you can just about manage to get meta, uh, this kind of meta science funded in psychology. Um, but it's incredibly difficult to get this funded in the environmental field at the moment. Uh, huh. And until we until we get this kind of evidence base up and running, then it's going to be angry people like me ranting. Um, and that's that's relatively easy to deflect. So we really need the empirical evidence that these things are problematic. Um, and, you know, how we do that, how we get that done well without funding is tricky, but we need more matter science. Next slide. And this slide is really just to say, you know, Good science is about collaboration. You know, evidence synthesis is about collaboration. A lot of the folk who work in evidence synthesis are nice folk. Um, you've got, we've got to work together as teams. And this is these are some of the people who've kind of helped me with evidence synthesis over the last few years. Um, and, you know, I consider these guys my friends and collaborators. And that's it. I'm done. <laughs> Thanks, Gav. That was brilliant. Cool. No problem. Uh, Matt or Charles, have you got a question? You go. You go. Uh, well, I was going to ask about what does pre-registration look like in different disciplines? I'm still trying to unpack this. Right. So it's in... Like a lot of this stuff, it's actually best developed in the in the domain that needs it least. <laughs> right, okay, which is medicine, you know, because if you think um, clinical trials were being registered before people even started doing meta-analysis, that was how um, Charles, what's his bloody name, kind of had the idea of, oh, shit, we should stick these together. <laughs> um so even though most of the time in medicine, you know that what you're interested in, this is a huge generalization, but, you know, you're interested in whether people are dead or alive. You know, if there's a study and basically what you want to know is how many people are dead or alive and you're not reporting it, it's instantly clear <laughs> that you're not reporting a really important outcome. Similarly, if you're talking about some, you know, some cancer therapy or whatever, and you're not including you know we know a lot we know it's this class of drug well we know we're expecting these adverse events and if those adverse events aren't being reported we know it's a big problem but then it gets more complicated so imagine you're doing some genetic thing and you're looking at blood markers you're really interested in something else but you're using all of these surrogate outcomes you know, and so that's why, and or you don't know which region of the gene you're looking at. So they would be medical examples that transfer across to like ecology and social science much more, where it's like if you just go into there and you, you could you could you could put your you know you can put your tweed jacket on and your pipe, and you can take that old school statistical approach to it and you analyze it this way and you analyze it that way and you know you honestly report all the patterns. But, you know, you know what these kinds of databases are like. They're absolutely massive. And, you know, as soon as you get the sniff of that high impact paper, bang, that's it. You go for it. And and all the rest of it and goes out the window along with the tweed jacket. And, the, you know, mm. so that's why you that's why pre-registering stuff is um really really important here's another example in, in ecology that i was chatting about with matt just this week which was there's a paper came out last week in journal of applied ecology looking at a long-term grazing experiment and they'd found out that you know if you stop managing the land grazing that you got more birds higher species richness for birds in in the unburnt plot you know and 
if you looked at that paper and you look at it on face value, it's pretty good. You know, it's a long term experiment, all the rest of it. It all looks good. If you read that paper, you know, I'd probably have found some issues with it because I always bloody do. But, you know, you look at it and it's probably OK. But then they wrote a blog about it. And the first thing they did was they overhyped it. So it was like, this is how this is evidence that we can rewild everywhere and it will all be wonderful. And it's like, no, it isn't. It's evidence that if you stop grazing on a small spatial scale, you might find more birds nesting in those plots. <laughs> um, but the but the the bigger kind of issue is that it, they admitted in that blog that they'd never intended to measure this thing in the first place. Huh. So so that raises it does raise an interesting question because it's like. Is it something that, well, this is a really important thing that people would be really interested in and we'd never intended to measure it, but it's really important and so we are going to measure it. And it's that kind of evolution of, 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 of the research. Or is it, here's something that we can get a high-impact paper, da di da di da and we can tell everyone that rewilding is good, which fits with our kind of mission statement. So I've got a horrible feeling that we've actually got an example there of um, harking. Now, mm. if it had that study pre-registered and said, this is what we're measuring and this is why we're measuring, it have been fine. Even if when they're kind of wandering around and they go, oh, hang on, I wonder whether or not species richness of, of birds is increasing here. They could have updated it and said, we've got a new research question that's interesting because the policy context has changed or... The experiment's been running for 20 years, and now we're going to look at this. But it's just that knowing that they haven't just gone and selectively reported it. You know? huh. Or the other example, would be, do you remember that paper that was, came out about five years ago talking about the gay gene? No. And, um, there was a paper that found the gay gene. You know what I mean? Yeah, right. And they've done the same thing. And it's like, well, you know, you've got a big database, so you've got power. And you've got so fucking much stuff in there that, yes, you're going to find a relationship between A and B. Yeah. And it's... So, so that, but that... to play devil's advocate, if they hadn't overhyped it, was their finding, you know, they ended up measuring something they didn't intend to measure and that ended up yielding the most interesting results. It doesn't necessarily mean that there's, you know, bad practice. No, no, that example is a tricky one because it is, this yeah. is it's, it's, I'm not saying that it's, that it's biased and that it isn't evidence-based. Um, I'm saying I can't tell if it's biased. Yeah, but I mean, so I suppose I'm coming at it from like coming from a, you know, a data science kind of perspective as, you know, having worked in all sorts of different contexts, but the, you know, the, I'm now what, eight years into my research journey and every single research gig I've had, whether it was in statistical epigenomics or in social science and, you know, history and philosophy of science like I am right now, my job has remained the same. And my job is to take existing data sets, work with them so that we can analyze them and you know, draw research conclusions. But the vast majority of the time, we're not generating new data, we're not designing how the data will be generated. The data already exists and then where you know, my, I like, I rarely get to design the data I work with, I suppose is my yeah. point. So, yeah. Yeah, from a data science perspective, I find pre-registration kind of, you know, confounding and curious. Like, I certainly see what people are saying about harking. But on the other hand, in mathematics, we hark all the time, right? Like, we, you know, explore uh, proof. Like, uh, I mean, my, my master's level thesis, we ended up proving something we didn't intend to prove. But in the process of proving one direction we discovered that we could prove in another direction and it's a proof so it holds its logic is completely infallible right so that's harking but i don't think there's anything wrong with that style of harking in a pure maths context and then data science is somewhere you know along that spectrum of well, the I vast think is, is when it's when you develop you know it depends what you're doing no, yeah. the real the real big problem with this is if you were saying if you were looking at evidence of effectiveness, huh. 
or if it was like these genetic examples where you're saying there's a relationship between A and B, you know, whereas if, you if you're developing a model of a world and you're saying this is a model of a world that's useful, mm. then, then it's less of an issue. But even then, I'd say you should, you know, there's nothing wrong with saying, you know, saying up front what you're trying to do. Why yeah, I mean, do? like, well, certainly kind of I'm in situations where playing... we ask simulations on different parameters to get better yeah. simulation well, results, right? And so how do, and so I, I, I can see that as a component of statistics research where when we're developing an estimator, if we hack the parameters and distributions that we simulate the data from to test our estimator and we drop all the distributions that don't yield yeah, nice right. results for our estimator, right? Like there isn't a protocol that's that is, I mean, I'm doing a PhD in the statistics department ostensibly. We're not given a protocol by which we choose the parameters for the simulations. It's just, oh, you know, get some variety is the closest I got to getting guidance. Right, and that's and that's the old school statistical approach, which is, the, you know, and it is where a lot of the kind of AI type routines fall over, you know, it's that idea uh, of find a relationship and then test it to destruction. But you know, that's the old school thing is you find the relationship, then you test it to destruction and you say, oh, and you publish this, erudite paper that was we found this relationship but it, we've tested it to destruction <laughs> well you only publish it if it stands to being tested to destruction but now what happens is you come along you find the relationship and you're flipping publish it as fast as you can before someone yeah. else tests it to destruction <laughs> <laughs> you, you know what i mean that's the i mean i'm not saying that we shouldn't that we shouldn't be doing exploratory science and the scientists shouldn't say oh wow look here's something i didn't think about but i am saying that we should be you know we should be doing it in a structured way and it should be you want to know what you've done when you want to be able to say but what i've done hasn't been driven by knowledge of the results in a biased way yeah, so we want to be able to show as researchers, regardless of the context, that we've we've taken some steps to diminish our researcher degrees of freedom leading us astray. Or, 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 or what, what the basis for decision was to go down path A and not yeah. path B. You know, and, 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 what, and what path A was. You know, the fact that path A and B exist. You know, that's the, that's the fundamental thing is just to report path A and path B exist. We went down path A. If you can yeah. explain why you went down path A and if you can say, and we went down path A before we saw the result, then that's more robust. And particularly if we're thinking about, you know, it's when you're attributing causation that this shit really matters, I think. <laughs> Yeah, that's what I was just thinking. Is you know, this is, think it's is less, really about causation? You know, when, you, when, you, when you're talking about effects or predictive models, or you know, then it really matters. It does get tricky because, like you say, you know, if you're flipping building a fancy model with loads and loads of distributions and loads and loads of parameters, and poof. But that's why we've got this whole open science thing, and you know, should be theoretically possible to kind of try and articulate that clearly what you've done why you've done it how you've done it show the models show the results even if it means it's another reason really why that having that 1500 word paper is kind of increasingly bollocks as well you know what we're really interested in is the data and the code mm. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Did you see that? Uh, the, I know you you don't shy away from controversy. The incendiary paper that came out just before Amos last year, um, the is pre-registration worthwhile paper that argued that where there's a weak link between theory and and the the scientific question that it's answering, pre-registration is neither here nor there. And I I think it sort of thrust was we have a much I'm, bigger I'm, problem I'm, with statistics. Yeah. That was was it that Dan Quintana um, 
Lati. Um, Sozoli, uh, Inus Van Rui, Danny Navarro, I think were yeah. all authors. Yeah. yeah. Um, and it, it was, you know, it was really making a case that, that we have really, really big problems with statistical theory and the application of theory to questions. So the theory, the questions that we're answering are not actually the questions that we're asking. We're, we're answering a different question. And where there's, where there's such a weak link between theory and concept, well, you know, garbage in, garbage out, we can pre-register garbage and follow our protocols and do what we said we we're going to do and come to erroneous conclusions. I don't feel like I have a, you know, yeah. I don't feel like I know enough, I mean, I, I would, but I found that paper compelling. And then yet I also sort of find me harking. I, I'm on the fence with all of this. I'm just trying to learn. I find I find this, I need to get greater clarity about my thoughts about theory, if I'm honest. Okay. Mm. Um, but I have huge problems with people saying it's okay because we've got a theory. Mm. And it goes back to this issue of, um just having worked with far too many scientists who say this is to, to do this circular thing where they say this is the theory so that determines the structure of your model so there's the output of it and that then is evidence for the in support of the theory and it's just like how the fuck do you how do you figure that out <laughs> you know who i'm talking about here matt but i've been on you know i've been on multiple papers where that's happened and i've said this isn't on and i've been like and they've been absolutely mystified and gobsmacked at, at me saying you know this isn't good science this totally didn't get it hmm. and these are people with h indexes in the 80s huh. you know so and i think there's i think there could be a language thing because those people who wrote that paper were coming at it from a psychology perspective, weren't they? They were, yeah. It's a psych paper. And I think the part of the problem is that theory means different things in different domains and disciplines. Um, you know, and it'd be like, I would say, if you can, if you can draw me with a dag, Right, and then you say, and then you can explain why you've drawn that dag. Hmm. Is that a theory? Because if that's theory, that's cool. That's what I want. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and even if you're just saying, this is the dag that I'm drawing, this is what I'm doing now, I accept that there are other dags, and that might mean that there are other interpretations of this, but this is the dag that I'm using. Hmm. Well, that's kind of, you know, so if a DAG, if you can turn the DAG into a theory or you consider a DAG a theory, then yeah, by all means, you know, having a strong theory is important. But I think a lot of it comes from this idea that, you know, there's a mathematical proof or we've got some massive, like in physics, where you've got some massive framework that ties shitloads of really disparate observations together. And if you go and collect a tiny bit of data and it doesn't agree with it, then you're not going to just chuck all of that theory out the window. And that is just so different. If you talk about that kind of theory in physics, that's so different to someone talking about the theory of planned behavior in psychology. Hmm. Um, you know, which is like an interesting way of viewing the world and nothing more. And an interesting way of viewing the world you know so then if they're saying we're gonna you know if they're saying we've taken the theory of planned behavior and we've designed a questionnaire with that in mind and we've designed the analysis with that in mind that's cool it's if you're saying that and you're being transparent about it you know you might very well be wrong it's that multiverse thing and it's like well there are a load of other theories it's like that's cool but it's when you do that circular thing and go back and say, and this is now proof of a theory, that there's a problem. Mm. Um, and that is an area where, you know, if you unleashed a random forest or an AI algorithm on that data set, you'd get a very different conclusion. They're making massive structural assumptions on the basis of that theory. And in some ways, I'd rather not have the theory and I'd rather have that uniform probability distribution across the multiverse. 
and say the truth is out there, but we don't know what it is. It doesn't roll off the tongue as well, though. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't, mate. It doesn't. But do you, I mean, what do you reckon, Matt? Do you? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting what you say about theory because I guess I mean, I've been, I came from ecology background, and yeah, ecology loves its theories, and they love writing the same theory again and again in different, giving it different names. So maybe that's why there's so much resistance to <laughs> to this approach in ecology, at least because. Yeah, everyone has a pet theory. Uh, it's also a great way of getting a high impact paper, isn't it? Is that you have a theory and then you do some kind of experiment or a model that fits with the fit. And that's what they really like. If you've got a model that proves the theory or new data that proves the theory, that's the kind of, that's the stuff that, you know. So you, you're saying with, like, journals mach love. with machine learning approaches, you think... They're less receptive. They're less sort of about testing theory, and they're more open to. Yeah. But they, I guess they also have their <laughs> their own problems. Um, yeah, my big worry about them is to causal is this causal stuff. And uh, have you seen this? Have you read the um, the book of Why by Judea Pearl and all of that kind of stuff, or seen Miguel Heren stuff? No. About causation and thinking about causation and causal frameworks. I think that I think that's the big problem there with 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 that kind of stuff. You just end up correlating two random things mm. too easily with the machine learning yeah. stuff. I think the COVID cats thing. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And they were looking at MRIs to try and train a machine learning algorithm to spot COVID lungs, and they identified a cat as a hundred percent COVID lung. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I mean that 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 I think there's a big I mean there's a big project to be done trying to get trying to well doing the kind of stuff that Matt was talking about earlier where you know pulling all these different data sets together and using a combination of statistical inference and machine learning to parameterize and structure those models but the one of the elements that really needs building into that is this causal reasoning um and it's there's a paper in combile about it but i've seen very very little you know in in the broader sense but i've seen very little published in ecology on this stuff and yet the epidemiologists aren't you know this is like epi Ellie's tweeting about it every five minutes and you've got judea pearl and miguel Heren arguing with each other about what the kind of broad scale frameworks look like and Cochrane are basing the risk of bias tools on it and it's massive it's massive it's kind of permeating huge sections of methodology uh and we're kind of ecologists are sitting there like economists and other little kind of sub-disciplines just kind of completely ignoring it so there's a high impact paper to be written on that yeah Cool. Any other questions or comments, or can we have an argument about something? <laughs> I guess. <laughs> I, so I've come from microbial ecology um, before, where I would probably say that harking is a predominant research practice yes. <laughs> in microbial ecology. Mm -hmm. you, you do your little experiment and then. You usually find something you didn't expect, and then you you you, you spin the story. Um, it's almost a taught research practice. Yeah, um, I think it is, and I think I, I seriously think most ecology PhDs are taught like that. I was taught like that. That's yeah. how I was told to to do it. You 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 find throw everything you possibly can at the model, find something interesting, and then make up a story to, to suit that finding. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah, I was I was taught I was taught in a in a very similar very similar way. I kept saying I don't know what I'm doing and why I'm doing it, and they were kind of like, "Oh, don't worry, little, you know, we know, we understand, you know, we understand how all this fits together, and you will too at the end." <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and I was like, uh, "Yeah, I was like, uh, are you sure about that?" <laughs> I feel seen. This feels like my entire research experience. 
So I guess my, my question is, so I've moved more, I'm moving into evidence synthesis now, and there's a lot of people saying the same things as you. Um, and it seems to be quite a popular opinion, which is good. But how do you then bring on board all of these other groups? Like, I can't imagine going to my old supervisor and trying to convince him to get on board with pre-registration. Because uh, a lot of it's about funding cycles as well, and it takes so yeah. long. To, so yeah. How do you bring those people? <laughs> I think it I think some of it will happen actually and I suspect it's like all it's this is is this is the social science of how does change happen in science. I think the first thing that will happen is the old fuddy duddies are gonna die. <laughs> yeah. yeah I was, he's not an old fuddy duddy, he's a lovely yeah. man. But, <laughs> yeah. but, but but you know what I'm saying? It's like yeah. <laughs> it's serious, quite seriously, change in science is really slow. And some, a lot of it is just the changing of the guard. And it's like, well, you guys are, you're the up and coming researchers. You know, you're, you're tomorrow's editors, aren't you? So you'll be driving the change. Ultimately. Um, I think, I think, I think some of it will, some of it will come in through um, top down. So, you know, that whole open science thing is going to start bumping in against RC UK or whatever your funding councils are. You know, they've got all of this open science stuff. And at the moment, it just means paying for publications to be available. But that's going to start changing into being more aligned with open science. And in medicine, that's happening through people like Welcome and the, these very influential and powerful funding kind of stakeholders. And where they go, others will others lead. You know, others will follow. They'll lead the way. So some of it is going to get imposed. But I guess with Welcome, they're sitting on huge amounts of cash, and they're quite a unique institution. So yeah, will, will they be? Will their changes disseminate into ecology? I think that I think they will, and it'll happen. You know, it'll 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 diffuse in. Um, you know, someone will someone will write a paper about it and. You know, some of it will diffuse in, but the timescales that it's going to happen on, I don't know. And it is a real problem trying to explain this to ecologists, trying to ex and trying to explain why we need this change. It's a, it is a huge problem. Um, have you got any ideas about what would make that more or less appealing? Uh, I, for me, it it all just comes from the top, from the journals, and mm. until we get rid of that model, <laughs> and but also we we aren't really proposing. I, I'm not. I'm still not clear of what the alternative model is. Like I don't, I, I can't envisage how I'm publishing my science outside of that. But that's part of the problem. Is I, I, I can't imagine that alternative world. I'm sure people are proposing. I'm sure, but it's not being. I can't you know yeah what it is <laughs> the kind of way that it's happening in medicine is if you think about you've got your primary study and you know you go off and you publish the primary study and that's that's more about having impact and being able to kind of you know satisfy universities about ref and all the rest of it um but you you know if it was a clinical trial then it was pre-registered and all the rest of it if it's going to change practice and get, end up in a guideline, then it has to go through the meta-analysis mill. So it goes through the meta-analysis mill to get turned into policy. Um, so you've got this kind of primary study, registration, data, meta-analysis guideline. And then where it's starting to go is towards this idea of living review, where the idea is that you kind of, you know, constantly update you don't do, a review isn't there's a paper but is a meta-analysis it's kind of like it's the data and the architecture to support the continual updating of that meta-analysis and i can quite easily see that being linked to the decision models so that it updates for decision models and then that updates to guidelines yeah so you're kind of ending up with this automated pipeline um uh, yeah and it and so you kind of you can kind of see how 
I think open science could go down that kind of road where it's more about collating the data and lodging it. Um, where are we at with tools for that? There's a huge, I mean, there's t there are bits along the chain are being worked on by different people in different communities in different ways. But I don't know if anybody's got a kind of overall coherent vision of trying to tie all of that lot together. I suspect that people like Brian Nosek have in some contexts. Cochrane have, defi have definitely got their eye on that kind of prize. Yeah. Oh. Um, Does that challenge significantly? Aren't journals just going to find a way to capitalise upon something like that? And it, like, if they, I think it would be great if Nature and stuff got on board with feed registration more widely, but. Yeah, I think I, I think that. Yeah, sorry, I think I think you're right. I think that is how it'll go. It'll be little steps. It'll be little steps in the right direction. But anybody who's got kind of skin in the game and power and influence will do what they can to hang on to it for as long as they can. But you're still going to have this problem of individual scientists, not not met, sort of meta scientists. Uh, they need to somehow stake their claim or show that they're a good scientist. So. How yeah. do they do that within this framework of everyone collectively? Like this, this it's like kind of this cooperative versus competitive. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean that that really, you know, yeah. How we how you set up a new reward system for scientists, yeah. and uh, you know how you try and stop them from gaming it. I think, yeah. I wish Are I knew the I wish I knew the answers. <laughs> 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 The just, kind of the, the ultimate thing that you get in medicine with that is this idea of prospective individual patient data analysis, which is where even before studies have begun, you get a kind you get the community gets together, like say it's a pain study or whatever. So the European Pain Federation get together and say, right, we want to know the answer to I don't know cannabinoids or antidepression, you know, how do antidepressants for chronic pain or whatever the fuck it is. Um, and they say, who's interested in doing the trials in this area? And they all get together and they agree what the trial design is. They all go off and do their independent trials, but they do them to the common protocol. And they agree up front that the analysis is going to be this individual patient data, data meta-analysis. And there are five or six examples of that being done where everything is actually prospective and everybody collects the same data in, the, in an agreed way and you have that argument and and then you collect the data to a common format and it all goes into one analysis um there's a methods group for it prospective uh, individual patient data methods group i think it's lisa what's the second name oh god i've forgotten a fucking second name Anyway, you can check that out on Cochrane. Yeah. Um, but, you know, that's so well, in medicine, that's so well structured because there are these units, you know, these clinical trial units basically exist to run randomised control trials. And the, and the reason the reason for collabor collaborating is, oh, well, if we collaborate and do this and we do a prospective meta-analysis and da di da di da then, you know... I still get the funding. I'm going to get a high impact paper instead of a lower impact paper. Um, it's prestigious. It feeds into the guidelines. And, and they're kind of structured to do that and to fund themselves that way. And, and the reason for collaborating, even if you don't want to, is, you know, if you're trying to recruit the right group of patients, then, you know, you just need lots of you need lots of hospitals collaborating with you. So if you've got five different trial units in five different countries, that makes sense to do that. Um, and we just not we just don't have any frameworks for doing that. And if you you know, someone might say, oh well, what about H twenty twenty? Couldn't you do that kind of thing with them in ecology? But it's just the incoherence in those projects is just a joke. It has to be seen to be believed. <laughs> so I don't know how you do that. I guess if I'm thinking about microbial ecology in that system, the reason it wouldn't work is because microbial ecology experiments are relatively cheap and you can do them 
in a relatively short amount of time. Yeah. In the lab, which is why everyone's now testing big ecological theory in micro. Yeah. So, and that means that loads of people can potentially do that, but it also means that loads of people are competing, working on the same theory. And it's how to get them to talk to each other and collaborate. And yeah, yeah. But there's always a risk if you engage with someone that you that you give away what you're working on, they scoop you. Yeah, right. So it really is this competition versus collaboration. And if I don't know if you've read that John Ionides plus paper, but one of the things it says is when you've got lot, a large number of small groups working on the same problem, that's when you generate these issues more as well. And that's why people will be resistant to pre-registration as well, because they, they show their hand, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> But if it's a requirement, then that issue goes away. Yeah. And that's kind of, I mean, that is starting to creep in a little bit, isn't it? There's the Royal Society journals are saying pre-register. And so on. Okay. It's, start okay. creeping, it's starting to creep in. You know, it could kind of get to a point where if you've written a good, a good protocol and pre-registered it, it's like, well, that was the idea. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. You know maybe maybe people like me will sit at our laptops and write protocols and never actually do anything <laughs> even just plan stuff oh, yeah. um, and get credit for it but that wouldn't be you know that would be all right wouldn't it and then other people do things and get you know that would be an interesting idea where it's not i write my protocol and then i go off and do the work and then i publish you, can you imagine a world where matt that has a mad idea and he writes the protocol and I've got some resource somehow to be able to do that protocol. So I go and collect the data and then someone else does the synthesis. Charles goes off and does the synthesis. You no, know, and it's kind of like we've all done our bit and we've the evidence base is accruing and we all get kind of credit for doing our bit in some sensible way. I hadn't thought of that before. Yeah. yeah, I guess scientists are very precious, though, and <laughs> they, they like to show their creativity and imagination. And if they had someone else doing that, I think that that's sort of a neglected part of all this is, well, ego. <laughs> yeah. yeah, there's definitely massive, uh, you know, this is some of the stuff that depresses me with science is, you know, it's so highly competitive. And, um, you know, it, a little bit of competition is a good thing, but it really feels like the pendulum has just gone so, so far. And everybody's competitive and we all have to fight for everything. So people just don't work as teams anymore. Yeah. You know? um, I do, I do, you know, I go outside of academia to work, <laughs> to work, to work with teams. Um because it's so hard. It's so hard to get everybody working together and building the trust. Yeah. But Big I mean, problem. If, you, if you're going to have move more people towards meta science, then I don't know if you had 50 50 ratio, that might solve a lot of that. Because I think maybe that's why meta scientists are more on board with all this, is because they sort of require that it's part of their working practice. The, working across yeah i don't know yeah certainly my kind of experiential thing is that people in there are fewer i mean there are some with some notable exceptions there are fewer bastards in meta science than there are in general science but god the exceptions are there be wary of them um but uh yeah it's 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 not easy and again i think it is some it's something that's very real and you know we get these opinion pieces about how tough it is especially for ecr um quite regularly and again it's something that you guys are going to need to sort out because quite apart from you know being exhausted from fighting and getting your careers established and getting going and then fighting for funding and then fighting for who's going to be editor of what journal and all the rest of it you know, that's exhausting if you're going to do that for all your life. Why the fuck would you bother? <laughs> you know what I mean? You want to get on with the science and doing the research and answering these questions. 
um, and you know, and, and having this market-driven competition, at some point there has to be some pendulum swinging back against that. Uh, maybe it'll come out with COVID and everything. Maybe things will change. Yeah, there's something I saw this morning about randomized control trials and what we can learn from COVID, which is quite interesting. Yeah. In terms of in terms of collaborating and getting and sharing data and yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's if you look at it from the point of view of the general public who's paying for this stuff, or a decision maker, mm. it's absolutely insane. I mean, I'm just I've just done various bits of inputting into this whole debate about burning, because they're looking at the upland, um, they're looking at the revision of the peak code uh, right now. George Eustace is looking at it all this week, um, and so I've kind of got a bit of skin in that game. And um, when you look at that evidence base that underpins that and you look at how the scientists work and, you know, some of them say one thing and some of them say another and both of them have got high impact papers by saying what they've said. And now if you just can't help thinking if they'd done some of this evidence based stuff 10 years ago and sat down in a room and said, what should we measure? How should we measure it? You know, if you'd spent the same money that has been spent on all of those individual research projects and it was put together in a big lump and they said, you're not competing for this. We want you to do the opposite. We want you to work together to use it as effectively as you can. How much better the evidence base would be now to make those decisions if, if you could get them to do that? Because, of course, the trouble would be if you're sitting in that meeting, then... Both of them are going to argue the best way of making use of this money is to give it all to me. <laughs> so it's, mm -hmm. so sounds, it's, sounds it's like last October. <laughs> yeah, I have had a fair few of those ones. And it is that it's how do you get it's how you move how you move on from that. It's it that there's bits of a big I definitely agree there are big problems with funding. Um but you know if, if, have you guys sat on grant panels? No. Yes. Yes, I have. Yeah. Because um, that's a massive eye-opener as well, you know. Yeah, it was. The people assessing the grant. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's uh, the, My window into grant panels is similar to my window into peer review, whereby I learned that often it's, it's not necessarily the people who are the most exp expert that are assessing it it's the people that are available yeah yeah and the way decisions turn and you know and the bias in that bit it's you know it makes the publication side of things look benign it really does and in the uk it's a massive massive old boy network huh really, it really really is um you know and you can't and again you know i've I've got so incensed on multiple occasions that I have tried to toy with doing the meta science, and they won't release anything. They won't release anything. So you can know who's on the panels and you can know what got funded, but you can never find out what didn't. Hmm. Um, but I can see how you could do, you know, you could do some lovely work with citation networks where you look at how connected are the people who were on the panel and how connected are they to the things that got funded compared huh. to compared to the papers that are coming out from contempt you know what i mean yeah. from the people who didn't get funded but who were working in the same discipline you know did you say that there were 20,000 am i right there's 20,000 covid papers already it's insane did you say that? <laughs> it's insane yeah. I mean, when we talk about what we should be funding, we, we, we can't possibly justify funding that many studies into COVID. I say this being on a research group who's, you know, my contract's been extended so we can study COVID. But, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Directly benefiting from this. So, you know, um, but yeah, it's and like, the, talk the, about um, research, Matt. 
you know, there's some interesting methods innovation that has come as a result of it. Like Cochrane have changed their stance on rapid reviews as huh. a direct result of COVID. Um, but then well, well, equal, yes. equally, there's a huge amount of garbage that's being that's being churned out as well. And again, you know, if you did an analysis of research waste, looking at COVID, you know, you don't need to look very far before you go, well, crikey, what, you know, why is this dangerous bollocks being disseminated? Mm. What's the stance on rapid reviews? Um, they've become much more relaxed about it now. So, you know, it used to be before that, you know, you've got to have a protocol and you can't stick a protocol together unless it takes at least six months and... Yeah. You've got to have, you know, you've got to do these kind of massive, massive exhaustive searches and look at, you know, you've got to do every single step of a review in duplicate. Um, and they've gone, you know, oh, OK, you know, maybe doing more of a scoping search, identifying the big studies, uh, having an appra having a quick appraisal of how biased they are and sticking them together in a meta-analysis. Yeah, yes. okay, maybe that is the way to go. I've seen a lot of kickback to that from um so yeah, I follow a lot of like microbial people and some of them who are quite involved in the COVID testing. And they they're slating rapid reviews on Twitter right, constantly. Yeah. So it's quite a different like yeah, part so maybe yeah, part of it is social media as well and the echo chamber we have. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I've got I've got kind of mixed feelings about it because I think a lot of the time full systematic review is way too onerous mm. and it's just a resource waste. And I think there's an awful, you know, there's a terrible tendency, especially in ecology, to do these massive cumbersome searches. And then they don't even bother with critical appraisal at all or hmm. hardly spend any time on the meta analysis. And I'd much rather see the time and energy going into the critical appraisal and the synthesis. Or, or a decision model. How often do you see a decision model coming out the other end? Um, you know, so I'd much rather see the resource used at that end than on the searching end. Um, and that's because there's been very, you know, there's been yeah. one review that I've done where searching in a non-English language made a difference. And there's one review that I've done where I found a study that was really important that hadn't been cited by anybody or anything. You know what I mean? It was completely kind of, if I hadn't done a massive exhaustive search, I would never have found it. So that's two examples where all of that stuff mattered. And yeah. the other, I don't know how many reviews have I done now. You know, well, if you talk about, you know, if you add editing and reviewing and everything, we're talking about hundreds. So, you know, no, that's, yes, yeah, that's it, yes, it, it matters sometimes, but it certainly most of the time it really doesn't bloody matter. Yeah. Okay, that's good to hear. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it matters for trying to get it published, depending on who yeah. you try to publish it with and all of that kind of stuff and who peer reviews it. Yeah. Um, but if you think about that grade thing and you think about that risk of bias, that's the other way to think about it. You think about that overall strength of evidence and you go, even if I have missed a study, is it going to make a difference? Because mm -hmm. it's like, you know, if you've got a problem with precision, it's going to have to be a fucking massive study. If you've got a problem with risk of bias, you're going to have to somehow have missed a really good, well-designed study. Yeah. Uh, if it's a problem with inconsistency, you're going to have to have missed, you know, a huge database that looked at the same thing across loads of different species. Um, yeah. You're going to have a problem with publication bias, whatever the fuck it is. You, do you see what I mean? You say, so, so you, it's like, well, okay. If I found that even if I have missed a study, it's probably not really going to have very much impact on my conclusions at all. Yeah, I think sometimes perhaps we're too idealist and yeah. <laughs> we're too yeah. far the other way. <laughs> and maybe that's why that we can't, well, we're having difficulty speaking to the other side kind of thing. Or yeah. getting bored. But if you're having, if you're doing rapid review and you're having to try and justify it, then do go on a Twitter and have a look at some of the Cochrane gang. Mm. And you'll find some you'll find tweets and some references to stuff saying, you know, that are a bit more. Well, you know, maybe sometimes rapid review is OK. Um, yeah. 
there's some interesting sensitivity analyses being developed as well that look at that. Like if you're doing a network meta-analysis, there's a fantastic thing now called threshold analysis, um, which basically does a sensitivity analysis where it says, how much does one thing have to change? How big does this parameter have to change by in order for it to change the thing that I'm interested in? Yeah. And, it, and so you can do that. It does that across the entire model space. So it's kind of like a glorified multi-way um, leave it leave one out analysis, you know. Yeah. Um, and it's not very useful for that overall thing, but it's really useful for going around for each parameter and going, oh well, actually, you know, if this if the effect of drug A was twice as big, it still wouldn't change my conclusions. So even if I have got biased information on drug A because I did a rapid review, it doesn't matter because the effect could be twice as big and it still wouldn't have a, it still wouldn't change anything. Hmm. And that, that's where the, these also ensemble methods can be really useful, I guess. Because yeah. that's exactly what they do, right? They they yes. randomly select papers. What well, well, if you were to do? Yeah. And yeah. Yeah, but you want to do you want to do as well as doing the papers, pulling the papers in and out. It's you know it's what model you've stuck it in. And, yeah, but they, I guess that's that's like a random forest would do that anyway. It, it subsamples the samples going in and the explanatory variables. So yeah, something like yeah. That would be yeah, random forest with waiting would be great. What's the waiting? Sorry. Well, if you've got your multiple studies. Then you right. want to wait by the inverse variance of each study or whatever. Or as long as your sample sizes are above 30, you could do it by sample size. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Um, thanks, Gareth. That's, that's been really amazing. Um, I think the discussion at the end is really useful as well so we'll keep that in the video i'm just going to stop really recording oh, bloody hell okay well, yeah <laughs>